You've got to believe in your abilities. You've got to believe in your service, your company, your ideas, unquestionably. You've got to have faith, and that faith gives you patience. That is not going to happen as quickly as you want it to happen. A lot of things are going to happen that will catch you off guard. And so therefore, you've got to deal with and handle it as it comes. And not only that, but that faith and patience drives you into action. You've got to keep moving and keep plugging away. In the Far East, they have something that's called the Chinese bamboo tree. The Chinese bamboo tree takes five years to grow. And when they go through a process of growing it, they have to water and fertilize the ground where it is every day. And it doesn't break through the ground until the fifth year, okay? But once it breaks through the ground, within five weeks, it grows 90 feet tall. Now the question is, does it grow 90 feet tall in five weeks or five years? The answer is obvious. It grows 90 feet tall in five years. Because at any time, had that person stopped watering and nurturing and fertilizing that dream, that bamboo tree would have died in the ground. And I can see people coming out talking to a guy out there watering and fertilizing the ground that's not showing anything. Hey, what you doing? been out here a long time, man. And the conversation in the neighborhood is, you growing a Chinese bamboo tree, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, even Ray Charles and Stephen Wonder can see ain't nothing showing. You know that's how people gonna do you? So how long you been working on this? How long have you been working on your dream? It's good. And you have nothing to show. This is all you got to show? People gonna do that to you. And some people, ladies and gentlemen, they stop because they don't see instant results. It doesn't happen quickly. They stop. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to keep on watering your dream. And when it began to happen, they stop laughing. They said, look, whoa, look, look here. It's, look up. Hey, man, you know, I know you could do it. Look here, you got a job here? <laughs> <laughs> See, see, during those hard times, we didn't know how you're going to make payroll during those times when you fail and, and, and things didn't work out. They were, they were nowhere to be found. But you know what I discovered? When you're working at your dream, somebody said, the harder the battle, the sweeter the victory. Oh, it's sweet to you. It's good to you. Why? See, when, you, when it's hard and there's a struggle, see, what you become in the process is more important than the dream. That's far more important. The kind of person you become, the character that you build, the courage that you develop, the faith that you're manifesting. Oh, it's, it's something that you get up in the morning, you look yourself in the mirror, you're a different kind of person. You walk with a different kind of spirit. People know that you know what life is, that you have embraced life. You knew it was hard, but you did it hard. By the way, let me give you a secret. You're going to laugh at this. Why am I telling you this? You know squirrels can't find 74% of the nuts they hide? Is that a fun fact or what? No, I'm serious. These little fools, they can't find 74% of them. They didn't study on it. Is that crazy? Look it up. I, well, I'll prove it to you. Check this out. Look at it. I, I, I read interesting things. Go to Elmo. This is a breakthrough. This is like a breaking news. This should be on CNN tonight. Now it can be told. All about squirrels and nuts. That's what I read when I'm at home. Now it can be told. And let me tell you, scientists have long thought that gray squirrels, which are far more common to the eastern seaboard than their red cousins, can not only remember where they dug their holes, but also smell the nuts they've buried. But they must not be too good at either skill, since studies show they fail to recover 74% of the nuts they bury. Right there. Why does that matter? Because you've been burying your dreams all your damn life. And guess what? You keep thinking you're waiting for the right time. When winter comes, you go find your little acorns, right? You think you're going to find them? Let me tell you something. You keep burying those dreams, the longer you wait, the harder they are to find. It's time you dig those things out right now and find them and put them right in front of you again and go chase them. Say that you're with me on that. I, Jamie said it earlier and I said it, you absolutely can have it all here. You can have a great family and a great business and a, a great financial situation and feel great about yourself and travel the world and do whatever the heck it is you want, but you need to dig those dreams out right now. I want you to start picturing, what is it that you really want? Why are you really doing that? Really? Is it for any of those people sitting around you? Do you want to make any of them proud of you? Do you want to make prove all of them they were right? Do you want to do wonderful things for your children? Do you want them to, your children to know they can do anything in life because you've done anything in your life? God 
made you and believes in you. He's around you all the time. He wants to bless you. He wants you to do great work for people. The more you carry him with you into your phone calls and your meetings and the interactions with people, the more he'll bless them. There'll be setbacks. There's many people will be mean to you. That's all part of the process. That's part of the jock strap. That's part of the best day of your life, worst day of your life stuff. But let me just tell you something. You can't, you can't get there unless you invite those people with you. Now, are you willing to do the ugly, by the way? Do you know what the ugly is, right? The ugly is doing all the stuff the people who lose aren't willing to do. You got to make those phone calls. You got to see people. You're going to have to put up with some rejection. You got to put yourself in an uncomfortable place. Listen to me. Do it. Put yourself in an uncomfortable place. Don't negotiate it. Don't try to navigate it in your head. Negotiation, you will lose. Okay? Unrealistic people rule the world. Quit trying to be so daggum realistic. Okay? Remember this. Weird, rich, normal, poor. Can you remember that? Say yes. Get a little goofy. Look at Cardone. He's a complete whack job, just so you know. You got to get a little road dog in you. People are looking for leaders. People are looking for you. They don't know it yet, but they're looking for someone who will love in them. Introduce them into people that can change their life. Believe in them. Care about them. Tell them the truth. This company stands for something good. We do what's right for families. You should be proud of it. We do great work every day out there. Changing lives across the kitchen table. Conversations at a Starbucks. A meeting at a convention. A, a conversation across someone's kitchen table that changes lives every single time. It changes lives maybe you heard the story about the the evangelist here in texas way back in the horse and buggy days used to put up his uh tent in you know these various texas towns and hold tent revivals and he put up his tent one of these towns expected a big crowd to come and hear him preach and he got there first night of the tent revival and he walked inside the tent it was empty and he thought something must be wrong he waited till eight o'clock nobody showed up he waited till eight fifteen not a soul finally eight thirty one lone cowboy wandered up on his horse, tied his horse up outside, came in, sat down on the front bench, big empty tent. So the preacher thought, well, at least I better go down and talk to the cowboy. So he goes down and talks to the cowboy and he says, cowboy, I don't know what to tell you. He said, I'm the preacher. And this tent was supposed to be full of people. And he said, something's gone wrong. I really don't know what to do. I'm embarrassed. And he said, I don't know what to do. And the cowboy said, well, you know, I'm not a preacher. I'm just a cowboy, so I can't tell you what to do. But he said, I know this, if I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd at least feed it. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> the preacher said, hey, the cowboy is right. If you've got a message to share, if there's one person or a thousand, don't let your ego get in the way. You know, you should do the best you can. So he got kind of inspired by this conversation with the cowboy, jumped up on the platform, started preaching as if the tent was full of people. And he was so inspired, he just kept going, kept going, went for an hour, went for an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half. Finally, wound down and quit. Come down off the platform, talked to the cowboy again, said, well, cowboy, what did you think of my sermon? <clears throat> the cowboy said, well, I'm not a preacher, so I can't really tell, I'm just a cowboy. But he said, I know this, if I went out to feed my cattle and only one showed up, I'd feed it, but I wouldn't dump the whole load on it. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> if it seems like we're dumping the whole load here today, I guess we really are, but you guys are working hard. Does anybody have four pages of notes? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. My job, I'm getting it done. Wonderful. We should give a prize one of these days for the most notes. Fantastic. I congratulate you. You're working as hard as I am. I appreciate that. Okay, we got some more work to do, so let's go to work. Everybody's okay? Say, I'm okay. I'm okay. All right. I'd love to take you with me as my traveling audience. Wow. We've covered the first two abilities in the personal development quest. One is the ability to absorb, don't miss anything, pay attention, good watchword for the 90s, pay attention, things are moving so fast these days, you gotta pay attention, pick it up, soak up the colors, soak up the sounds, soak up what's going on. Second, respond, let life touch you, let the emotions affect you as well as the sights. Now here's the third ability, develop the ability to reflect. Reflect means go back over, study it again. Go back over these notes that you're taking today. Go back through the cassettes one more time. Read the text one more time. But there's more to it than that. Go back over your day. I call it run the tapes again. 
so that the day locks in firmly. Here's some good times to reflect. One, at the end of the day. Take a few minutes at the end of the day. Go back over the day. Who'd you see and what'd they say and what happened? How'd you feel? What went on? So that you capture that day. A day is a piece of the mosaic of your life. Number one, don't treat it casual. Number two, get from the day. And then number three, go back over the day so that it locks in that experience, the knowledge, the sights, the sounds, the panorama, the color motion picture of the day. Just lock it in so that it will serve you for the future. Having that day, not missing. Next, take a few hours at the end of the week. Call time to reflect. Go back over your day timer. Go back over your calendar. Go back over your appointment book. Where did you go and who did you see and how did it feel and what went on? Capture that week. A week is a pretty good chunk of time. Next, take half a day at the end of the month. Call time to reflect and do the same thing again. Go back over what you read. Go back over what you heard. Go back over what you saw. Go back over the feelings to capture it so that it serves you. Next, take a weekend at the end of the year to establish this year now firmly in your consciousness firmly in your experience bank so that you've got it so that it never disappears good ability to acquire the ability to reflect go back over remember 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 it's so valuable to be able to remember the thought remember the idea remember the experience remember the occasion remember the day remember the weather remember the emotion remember the complexity remember the highs remember the lows so valuable at the end of the day Lock that day in. Lock the month in. Lock the week in. Lock the year in. Well, listen, on the way to accomplishing your dreams and visions, there's going to be a lot of challenges. There's going to be a lot of setbacks. It's not going to be easy. And discipline is a huge part of it. But more important than discipline is your faith. You, you are a religious country. If you do not hold on to your faith, whatever it is, you cannot make it. You can't. I'm sorry. You, I don't care what your faith is. Without your faith, without your faith in God, along with the discipline, you will never make it. You cannot get to the top without faith. If you get to the top without faith, it's temporary. It will not last. You have to stay focused. Because listen to me, it's really, really hard to be successful. Let me tell you this. Look at me. It's really, really hard to be successful. But I want to tell you something else. It's really, really hard not to be successful. I've been both. See, you see me today, but you didn't see me in school when I had a severe stuttering problem. I couldn't talk without a stutter. And I, 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 I flunked out of school. You're looking at a man who was homeless. I lived in a car for three years. Me, you see all of these TV shows and suits and Hollywood. But I lived in a car for three years. I made a lot of mistakes. You have got to be really, really focused because challenges are going to happen all throughout your life. You're going to be told no over and over and over again. You're going to have people in your family who will not believe what you tell them. I'm going to be a TV star. No, you're not. No, no, you cannot. You, you cannot be a TV star. No one in this family is a TV star. No one in this neighborhood is a TV star. No one in this school is a TV star. And you stutter. And you black. So what? You, you now you're going. Whoa! I'm not. I cannot stop being black. So this is, this is with me. So my focus and my faith, my belief in God, He has kept me through all. All of my dark moments when I was living in that car for three years God he kept me he kept me understanding that I, he was just testing me that I had to pass all my tests that's what happens to a lot of old people see they stop passing the test they, they thought that because something happened to them negative along the way that it wasn't meant to be that's not true it was just a test you got to keep passing the test you dig it's not gonna it's not, life is never going to be just oh you, you just can't you know silly you can't just <laughs> oh happy oh happy happy no something gonna happen somebody you love gonna die something you want to happen won't happen Something you attempt to do, you're going to fail at it. This is life. This is all the time. So the dream that you have has to be bigger than all your problems. My dream was so big, it was bigger than all my problems. So when I was homeless, my dream was bigger. When they told me no, my dream was bigger. 
When they said you were black, we would not hire black people here. My dream was bigger. What? Bigger. My dream was bigger than all my problems. And my faith in God, what? What they going to do? What? What? When you have God, you have everything. You have everything. That's serious business. That's the business. I want to give you a quote from Ralph J. Corner, who said this at a leadership conference when he was chairman of the board of General Electric. He said, we need from every person who aspires to leadership a determination to undertake a personal program of self-development. Nobody is going to order a person to develop. Whether a person lags behind or moves ahead in his specialty is a matter of his own personal application. This is something that takes time, work, and sacrifice. Nobody can do it for you. Now that, my friends, is good advice. Start living that advice. People who reach the top rungs in business, engineering, selling, law, real estate, medical care, people who reach the top rungs in any pursuit, get there by following conscientiously and continually a plan for self-development and growth. That's exactly what these tapes are about. Now, any plan for success has to have three components. The first is the what component. You've got to know what it is you're trying to do. The second is the how component. How do you go about accomplishing your goal? And the third component is the payoff, results. In this plan for success that you're developing now, the what component is built on the attitudes and techniques of successful people. How do they manage themselves? How do they overcome obstacles? How do successful people earn the respect of others? Now, the how of this plan for self-development and growth is a series of concrete guides for action like the one you've just heard for developing self-belief. You'll be hearing more of these. Let me emphasize that these guides work. They've been proven countless of times by thousands of people. I urge you to try them and see for yourself. This leads to the third component, results. Let me tell you what results you can expect and I assure you that conscientious application of this plan will achieve them. Your personal training program for success will bring you greater respect from your friends and family. It'll bring you the admiration of your business associates, greater status, increased income, and a higher standard of living. Think of this plan as an experiment, and you're the scientist in charge. You already have a fully equipped laboratory in which to work and study. That laboratory is all around you. It consists of the people in your life, the people you see on the street, the people you work with, the people you live with, and of course, yourself. This laboratory is rent-free, and there is no limit to the amount of time you can spend in it, nor to what you can learn from it. So, as the director of this laboratory, you'll want to conduct some observations and experiments. I want to give you an experiment to start with right now. To conduct this experiment, pick the two people you know that you feel are the most successful. If you want to, jot their names down in the booklet. And then pick the two most unsuccessful people that you know. And as you follow this plan for self development and success. Come back to this set of names and observe how the principles and ideas that you'll be hearing apply to these people. Anytime you run across an attribute or a practice that pertains to successful people, recall the names you've picked and see who it best applies to. And do the same for the unsuccessful attributes that you'll be hearing. For example, self-belief is the important attribute of successful people that David Schwartz has described. Which of the people you've picked does it apply to? If your experiment bears out the results of others who've conducted it, you'll notice that successful people adhere to the techniques and methods of positive big thinking, while unsuccessful people display the attributes of self-defeat and mediocrity. Now, one of the first attributes I think you'll consistently notice among unsuccessful people is a disease that is one of the biggest enemies of success. I call this disease excusitis. Here's what excusitis sounds like. I don't know if I can do this job. I mean, this is, this is really out of my league. I'm not a genius, you know. Well, I'd like to take on more of the work that would really be important to me, but I, I really don't see where I have the time to do it. I'm really rushed now just to finish the work that I already have. I can't imagine 
how I would find more hours in the day to finish more work. You know what they say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, and believe me, this old dog is just too far along to start anything new at this point. Look, with my health the way it is, I just do what I can to get by. I'm not about to press my luck and give myself a heart attack. Sounds pretty awful, doesn't it? And if you looked at the lives, ambitions, and accomplishments of these people, I can tell you what you'd find. Not much. A lot of mediocrity. In case after case, case, excusitis is the difference between the person who is going places and the person who is going nowhere.
In six years, you'll be explaining instead of celebrating. Having some ragged list like I had, reasons for not doing well pennies in my pocket. Could, should, don't do that. And if you'll just start the process of change, could, should, and will, you can start this whole process. And if you will, then put it into action. The miracle belongs to you. Jesus said to his disciple, it'll be simple. Go fishing, and the first fish you catch, look in his mouth. Peter said, okay. He was used to strange things happening. In this relationship, Peter goes fishing, catches the first fish, looks in his mouth. Guess what's in the fish's mouth? Coin. Peter says, wow, coins. Starts counting the value of these coins, and when he adds it up, guess how much it added up to? Exactly enough money to pay his taxes and Jesus' tax, which gives you Jesus' position on taxes. Now, we call that what? A miracle, only because we don't quite understand how it works. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It simply means we don't quite understand how it works. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done, postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. It'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, well, my mother lives down in Florida. Should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter written, clean that up, and don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing a letter? And the answer is yes. Where else would you start for life change, personal change? You don't need a pink package to fall out of the sky. You don't need massive bombard pre-conscious, subconscious, practice channeling, find a 2,000-year gold guru. I mean, you don't need any of that stuff. Pass on all that. Kids are afraid of that stuff. Too much of it. You'll be out on a limb with Shirley. I mean, don't pass on all that stuff. This stuff's too easy. This stuff's too simple. It's called take action, number one, on neglect, on errors, in discipline. Number two, start setting up some discipline. And if you'll do that, you'll perform a miracle. Now, here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, I would ask you to amend it. Let me give you the best of ancient script. Here's what it says. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, do it with all your strength, and do it with all your power. What a good philosophy. That kind of philosophy revolutionized your life if you haven't picked it up late. Guy slips in late, company doesn't seem to mind, slips out early, first one in the parking lot, heading for happy hour. Stretches his break, comes early for lunch, late back from lunch, company doesn't seem to notice. Guy says, best as I can calculate, I'm putting in about a half a day's work and I'm collecting a full day's pay. And the guy says, I got it made. Little does he know the seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor and about activity and about miracle and soil and seed and sunshine and rain and the economy and the banks and the money and the companies and the schools and what's going on. It's your philosophy and your attitude and then your ability to take action. All of that we call the process of life change, miracle working. Number one, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Here was number four, results, results. Every once in a while, you got to take a measure, see how you're doing with these three pieces, philosophy, attitude, activity. Now we take a measure called results. What is the results at the end of the day, the results at the end of the week? You can't let too much time go by without checking. When time goes by, six years I've been out there working when I met my teacher, Mr. Shope. Shope said, well, Mr. Rohn, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, in the last six years, how much money have you saved and invested? Let's go through a little tab list here. How much money have you saved and invested the last six years? I said, what? Zero. He said, you have messed up. You remember these notes. I like that. Messed up. He said, who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. What if you were 50 and broke? Right? Didn't need to change countries. Bought the wrong plan. What a sad scenario that would be. Shove said these questions. Let's go through some results. He said, how many books have you read in the last 90 days? I said, what? Zero. Wisdom of the world available. Change your life. Change your future. Wisdom of the world available. Develop, develop any skill you want. Earn the kind of income you want. Have all the treasures you want. Equities you want. Relationship with your family that you want. Everything that you want available. And the wisdom of the world to help you get it. Haven't read any books in the last 90 days. My teacher said, Mr. Rohn, you have messed up. I'm telling you, you've got the deal. I told T. Hobb when we were standing by the stage, I said, hey man, I want to work more with you. I want you to coach me. I want to learn from you. See, I found you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. Always have a thirst 
for learning. So I listened to Paul Harvey every day on the radio. While in school, I would go out and listen in his car. He gave me his keys. I was working to develop myself. And I continued to listen to motivational messages. And he would take me to see the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. I toured with him before he passed. You, you have something special. You have greatness within you. Don't allow your circumstances to determine who you are. Don't allow your negative thoughts to hold you back. You, you have something special. You can do more than you can ever begin to imagine. Dr. Peel was an incredible man. I, I admired him when he spoke. He gave me goosebumps. I can feel him in my heart. And, and I never forget, we were coming back to the school and Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. When Dr. Peel spoke, you didn't move. When he spoke, you were hanging on every word he needed. When he spoke, we didn't have to tell you to sit down and be quiet. Why? I said, sir, I could, I could feel him when he talked. I felt like he was talking to me, sir. He said, he was. I said, but he doesn't know me, but he was speaking to you. Did you feel him in your heart? I said, yes, sir. He said, most people feel him in their head. If you felt him in your heart, he said, listen to him, sir. Follow him, learn from him. And I would go to seminars and workshops. Anywhere I would find where Dr. Peel was, I would be in the audience. I would drive two and three hundred miles just to hear him speak. And my dream and vision was, was to share the stage with him. I thought about it. What is your goal? What is your vision? I want you to hold it in mind. There's some power in that. Because when I became involved in speaking, I never forget, I got a call from Og Mandino, who wrote the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. He said, Lass, I'm stuck in Philadelphia. I need to be in Kankakee. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale is appearing. I can't make it. I heard you're in Chicago. I said, yes, I am. Can you go and open for me? I said, yes, man. Oh, my God. Dr. Peale, I said, yes, I'd love to do it. And I went there and... I came, I said, hi, I'm, I'm Les Brown. He said, you're not the band of renown? I said, no, I'm, I'm Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. I'm here to speak. He said, come backstage. And his wife, Martha, was there. And she said, Papa, Les Brown is here, the speaker. And he said, Les Brown? Les Brown, shoot for the moon? Because even if you miss your land among the stars? I said, sir, that's my quote. I wrote you when I was in the 11th grade. I was a part of a special school special education class project. That's my quote. He said, I know. I end all my speeches with that quote. And Dr. Peel had a great sense of humor. A young man was backstage and I had so many questions to ask him and my mind froze up and the young guy said, Dr. Peel, how old are you? And he was up in age. He said, Sonny, I'm, I'm 92. The young man looked at him and said, I don't know if I want to live to get 92. He said, that's because you've never been 91. So my dad's drinking was the ultimate blessing in my life, even though it was terrible as a child. So my dad got sober and became my best friend. It was really cool. I watched my dad have two lives. I watched the first 40 years of his life. My dad was a good man, just like a lot of you are, but living a bad way. Drinking, running around, probably doing all the stuff that comes with doing that. And then he got sober and I watched him change his life. My dad's a humble man and I didn't know this. My dad's sobriety was interesting. Just gonna tell you this really quickly. My dad got sober ironically because he used to go to Hollywood to drink so my dad went to an AA meeting where it was all famous people but we lived two hours from there which was the hood so my dad would go to AA meetings in Hollywood with fame my fact my dad's sponsor in AA is a very famous actor and then my dad would come to the hood where we grew up and go to his AA meetings and so my dad ended up I didn't know this but my dad for years helped people get sober quietly two o'clock in the morning a text a lunch a breakfast anything he could ever do to just help another human being change their life I never knew it because he would never tell me didn't brag about it when my dad died he requested no funeral didn't want anybody talking about him plus it was COVID but for years he didn't want one but my I got a call from the AA meeting my dad went to and the guy said we just like to honor your dad at a park there'll be like eight or ten of us there would you come I said no I'm not doing that my dad said no my wife said you should just go it's gonna be ten people I show up to this park hundreds of people showed up and they got up and said we're here today to honor Ed Milet my own name first dude walks up he says my name's Jerry 34 years ago Ed Milet changed my life I walked into a meeting I had no hope I thought I was gonna die this man grabs me and says hey let's have breakfast tomorrow morning and he tells his story 
Next guy gets up, big old Samoan dude. Said, I was incarcerated for 15 years. My best friend's Ed Milet. He changed my life. Took every call, calls me every day, loves me, cares about me. Next guy gets up, very, very famous actor. Ed Milet changed my life. I came to a meeting 17 years ago. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from him, how many meetings we've had, how many times he's driven to see me when I was going to use again. Driven hours and hours. One time he drove to Sacramento, drove seven straight hours to see me because I thought I was going to use. He said, I'll be there in a minute. Seven hours later, my dad showed up. And I watched this whole meeting of these people just parading through about how my dad changed their life. And my dad had lung cancer and a really bad form of tumors wrapped all around his organs. And so my dad fought this for like nine years. And the last time he went into the hospital, my dad finally called me and said, I want you to come get me. Except he didn't talk like that. My dad was down to about 10 breaths a minute. So my dad's voice was my voice. In fact, if you called his phone number right now, that voicemail's still on there, my dad's voice. But my dad would talk like this in the hospital. <laughs> dad, they'll give you another steroid shot. You need to fight this again. This is my dad's life for months. Now I'm gonna tell you what he said in my voice because it'll take too long. He said, I'm gonna die in two days. I fought this for nine years. I did this for your mom, you and your sisters and the grandchildren. I'm gonna be gone in two days. I would like to die in my home with you and the sisters there. Come get me. I said, dad, he says, I'm serious. I called his doctor, he goes, I'd get him home. I get my dad home, he's in his living room. I was with my dad when he passed away, so were my sisters. An hour before my dad died, an hour before. So when you're dying this way, just so you know, they count your breaths. So my dad had gone from 50 breaths a minute to 20 to 10, some minutes five, some minutes three. Got to the point a couple hours before my dad died that he had a minute with no breaths. And so they took his pulse, he had no pulse, then he would breathe again for a minute. So it took a long time and my dad was really running out of breath. He was, he was basically suffocating to death. And uh, I tell you this because we thought he was gone and he came back and then he had a couple half hour windows of like 40 breaths a minute. His phone keeps ringing. He's got oxygen and he goes, Debbie, who's calling me? And she says, it's 905, answer it. My dad's got two hours left, answer it. She says, no, I'm not answering it. He says, grab it. He knew who it was and he knew that was someone who needed him. And my mother handed him the phone on morphine, drooling, oxygen, pulls it out. You can. And I watched him for 20 minutes, 20 minutes. My dad talked this dude off the ledge and changed his life. Bernardo was the last speaker at that service. I went to a week later. So in my dad's last minutes of his life, my dad was still changing people's lives, was still making a difference in the world. The reason I tell you that story is not to applaud for my dad. I tell you that story because who are you when no one's watching? Who are you when there's no incentive for you? My dad, there was no, my dad's gonna get any credit for that. He had no idea I was gonna tell this story. In fact, he'd be embarrassed if I did. Who are you when nobody's watching? What's the real difference you make in the world? See, the reason I know I talk like this, I've been at every economic level they eat. Cause my father was rough, man. Let me tell you a story. I was in college. My father didn't help me. I got in real bad trouble one time. I called home and said, Dad, I need some money. All right. So four days later, in the mail, an envelope came. It had two index cards so you couldn't see the money. When I opened it up, it had a note on the index card and it was a $5 bill. I pulled it out, saw the $5. The note said, this shit gonna have to stop. Four times. That's what the note said, though. I, you would lose effect if I did not read you what my daddy wrote. And my daddy did, so I think that's a free will. Just let me have it. That's how my father was. I'm gonna support you just enough keep you dying. This is enough to buy a sandwich and some water so you can live on to the next crisis. So I've been at the bar, I've been at every echo level. I know what it's like to die. I, so when I tell you what the hundred feel like, see, and enjoy the ride along the way. Quit waiting until you a millionaire to celebrate. There's joy in the journey. Listen to me. If you was making 50000 and you now make 100000 that should be a mini celebration in your life. When you go from 100000 to 250, that should be another mini celebration in your life. You got to buy some stuff to reward you along the way. There's joy in the journey. You don't have to wait till you meal. I want to be a billionaire. I really do. Because there's three black billionaires. Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, and Robert Smith. I didn't research it. No, I researched because that's where I want to go. Well, Steve, why you want to have a billionaire? Because they printing the money. There's joy in my, where I'm at right now. Oh, please understand I'm cool. But if I could get a billion, though. See, Brother Blue and I, Brother Blue has went with me, has traveled up to Washington, D.C., to Dr. Ben Carson at Hood. Well, let's talk about that for a second. I done had some things happen to me, man. President Obama's transition team 
I was getting off a plane one day. An assistant called and said, Steve, President Obama's transition team. President Obama and I were friends. I've interviewed, he's been on my talk show. I've been to the White House and interviewed him. He's been on my radio show more than anybody's show. I go to their parties. We friends. So his transition team called me uh, around the 9th of January and said, Steve, the president feels like it's important that we sit down and have a conversation with this new administration to see if there's something to work out. Not President Obama, just his transition team from White House. I said, okay, cool. Next thing I know, the Trump administration transition team gets in touch with the Obama transition team. My name come up. So on January 13th, they asked me to come to Trump Tower to meet with Donald Trump. Now, the hell I call it, the sheer misery for making that decision. I've been so many coons, Uncle Tom sellouts. I, I was stunned. I mean, the brutality of what happened to me on social media behind visiting that man in Trump Towers, it was alarming. But I'm sitting up in here and I'm trying to figure out because you don't know. So since you don't know, here come the hate. Uncle Tom, sellout, coon, Steve Harvey, shoe shining, celebrity friends I thought I was really cool with. Coming out, talking about he ought to know better. Who, what the hell wrong with him? Whoa, 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 whoa. If President Obama, the current president, and the incoming president say they want to talk to you, which one of you ain't going up there? Just, just raise your hand if you wouldn't go so I can see how stupid you are. I just go ahead. I just want this one. See, this is what I be really wanting to say. See, I can't say none of this in front of another group, but since it's us in here, oh, I've been wanting to say this since January 13th. You better believe this right here. I've been waiting on the right crowd. Well, I'm in front of a bunch of friends right now. So, see, I can say this because I'm around a bunch of friends. You understand? Friendship is essential to the soul. You can live without your father. You can live without a relative. You can make it without your mama. You can't live in this world without a friend. Friendship is essential to the soul. Oh, Philly, my Philly, I super. That friendship is essential to the soul. Yeah, I've been waiting on this. I'm glad Ricky Lewis asked me.